Hello, I'd like to invite you all um, to this very exciting panel that focuses on the role of education in PCBE. Um, the salience of this topic comes at a time when many young people are getting radicalized in the prospect of reaching these youth and those who may be at increasing risk through education-related interventions has been a central element in the strategy for countering the threat. Uh, interventions in this space, however, are not without challenges and the impact of such efforts has remained mixed. In taking stock of this existing evidence base, Rusi's Terrorism and Conflict Research Group has been conducting a two year long study under the prevention project. The project aims to assess the existing evidence to provide critical insight and lessons on what can and what has not worked in the field of PCBE. Today's panel is a second webinar in a series of studies conducted under this project. It seeks to interrogate the findings of Rusi's research in conjunction with insights from academics and researchers who've been critically engaged in the field. The first presentation in today's panel will, will be that of Claudia Waller, um, a research analyst at RUSI, who will discuss the key findings of the study undertaken as part of the project on the existing evidence base for education-based interventions to counter extremist messaging and radicalization. Following this, we will have a presentation by um, Professor Lynn Davies, who is a professor emeritus of educational uh, um, at the University of Birmingham and a co-director of the Social Enterprise Connect Futures. She will speak about her experience in this area as an academic and as a practitioner delivering trainings with her organization, Connect Futures. Um, following this, uh, Rafia Rahiz Khan, a clinical psychologist, will speak about the experience of her organization, social welfare academics and trainings for Pakistan in developing a critical thinking course based on the integrative complexity method. Um, each presentation will last around 10 minutes and thereafter we will open up the Q&A. Um, you are requested all to please pose your questions in the Q&A button. Um, I will then pose as many questions as possible to the panelists. Uh, we hope to be able to end by within an hour and uh, the discussions will take at least uh, 30 minutes. Um, this event will be followed by a webinar exploring the evidence base for PCBE communications led by Michael Jones, if you would like to stay tuned. So without a further ado, I'd like to invite Claudia to um, give the first presentation, please. Thank you, Gayatri, and thank you to everyone joining today. I'm just going to share my presentation here. Um, I hope you can see my, my screen now. Um, so um, just for a bit of background, um, I think Gayatri already covered some of this, but um, over the last two years, the Rusi Terrorism Conflict Research Group with funding from the Royal Norwegian Government has um, set out to map the evidence base um, for preventing and countering violent extremism um, interventions as part of our prevention project. And we've produced a number of literature reviews on what works and what doesn't in um, different thematic areas within PCB. And as Gayatri mentioned, we've already had our first webinar in this series um, on um, women-centric interventions in May. And we have another webinar um, coming up in exactly one week, same time next Tuesday on PCB communications. Um, so just a bit of a plug, if you would like to stay informed about our activities on this project and also in, um, receive invitations for these events, um, please sign up to our mailing list um, or um, follow us on Twitter. Um, now for um, our recent publication on education in PCBE, which we're launching today, um, we explored the evidence base for um, PCB interventions that are based in um, the formal education sector. I'm briefly going to highlight um, some of the key points from this publication, um, which asks what can work and what has not worked um, in education PCB interventions. Um, now, the role of um, schools and other actors in the education system um, in PCB is complex. Um, and there's no clearly established link between um, the level of education um, of individuals um, and their propensity to engage in violent extremism. And still in the context of the global shift towards education initiatives is thought to be a central element in the reduction of terrorism globally. Um, however, I already found that um, education um, focused PCB interventions are not without challenges. 
and the assumptions that underpin them um, don't always hold true. Um, many of the challenges of existing interventions can be attributed to the fact that um, most PCV efforts in the education sector, like in other sectors um, and subfields of PCVE, um, are not based on research and empirical evidence, but they're instead based um, on mainly, they're mainly policy oriented. Um, there's a general lack um, of publicly available evaluations um, of interventions. Um, and we've noted this across all of our um, publications. So if you followed any of our other um, publications, you'll hear us repeat this over and over again. Um, but even, you know, even in the field of, of education, there has been an increasing, um, an increase in scholarly publications um, exploring the um, links between education extremism and also the merits of, um, of different interventions. These publications don't always feed into um, actual interventions. They don't end up informing those interventions. Um, instead, very often the popularity of certain um, intervention subtypes um, appears to have been taken as a proxy of their effectiveness, um, thereby encouraging replication or repetition of these, um, these specific approaches. Um, of course, I should note that um, the lack of empirical evidence on the effectiveness of um, certain PCB intervention types um, in the education sector as well as in other fields doesn't automatically mean that these um, interventions are ineffective. Um, but of course, failing to base interventions on evidence does risk designing and um, implementing interventions that are ineffective or even outright harmful. For example, despite the well-intended um, ambitions of safeguarding young people in schools and other um, parts of the education system, um, the focus on youth vulnerability um, in practice often leads to um, the monitoring and policing of extreme thoughts and attitudes that young people may have, even if those young people aren't actually um, at risk of embracing violence um, as a means of achieving their goals. Um, the literature on radicalization um, shows us that the conflation of radical beliefs or attitudes and extreme behaviors um, is not actually supported by empirical evidence. And this assumption can actually lead to a shift um, in focus from safeguarding and preventing inclusive education to identifying, punishing, and rehabilitating undesirable students, whatever that may mean in a certain context. Another risk of basing intervention, of not basing interventions on solid evidence is to create unnecessary links between education activities and security considerations. Um, labeling education interventions that are relevant to the prevention of violent extremism as PCBE can discredit PCBE interventions in general. And it can also at the same time discre um, discredit, uh, sorry, unnecessarily securitize um, the field of education as a whole. And equally, if the um, immediate objective of, of PCB interventions goes against the long-term objectives of the education sector, um, uh, adding a PCB component to education activities or to curricula um, can actually threaten the reputation and the credibility of the education agenda as a whole. We also found that um, poorly designed and managed interventions may up doing more harm than good. Um, so, for example, interventions um, can create frustrations that can act as factors that are actually contributing to radicalization um, when they, for example, create expectations about employment opportunities that remain unfulfilled after the end of an intervention. And similar if, similarly, if specific groups are targeted in, um, by interventions that are aimed at the promotion of certain values, um, these interventions can actually lead to the stigmatization of certain groups. Um, so we've noticed this, for example, with, um, with regard to the teaching of fundamental British values in schools. Um, there's been a lot of criticism for um, this being a very limiting um, definition. Now, nevertheless, despite all these um, shortfalls and limitations, our research does suggest that education interventions can play a role in PCB in certain contexts if they effectively um, offset certain um, locally relevant push and pull factors of radicalization, including feelings of exclusion um, and perceived inequalities. Um, and also if they're designed and delivered in a way that resonates with students. Um, education interventions can also improve the sustainability of wider um, PCB projects if they're delivered in well-coordinated packages with other relevant interventions in this field. 
Um, but so many of the factors that drive individuals to violent extremism, including economic conditions and broader um, political and societal conditions, can be directly addressed through education initiatives. Um, but still, education um, and education systems can arguably contribute to making young people more resilient and better able to resist violent extremist narratives and recruitment efforts. Unlike interventions that are specifically targeted at young people who are thought to be at risk of radicalization or recruitment, these types of interventions tend to be um, directed at the entire population of students. Um, instead of tackling a specific risk, um, they aim to help students, and that means the whole body of students, um, to reject violent extremist ideologies before radicalization processes even begin. Um, now this makes it quite difficult to prove that interventions are actually effective um, because it's just impossible to you know, determine how many of these young people who were involved in these activities were ever going to turn to violent extremism otherwise. This is a problem we have in PCV in general, um, but I think this is generally true for, or this is especially true for interventions that are not specifically targeted at at-risk populations. But so we do have evidence from um, evaluations of existing interventions that suggest that if done right, um, certain approaches can make students um, more aware of the dangers of violent extremism and better able to resist and, um, uh, yeah, uh, more resilient, <laughs> sorry, of re um, recruitment and radicalization efforts. Um, we found a few general conditions for success across um, different interventions within the education field. So generally approaches that involve engaging young people in dialogue, um, even if it's controversial, rather than aiming to instill the right values from above to transform the entire population of students into desirable liberal democratic young people have a higher chance of success. Um, interventions should be bottom up and student centered and they should come from a perspective of empathy for the uncertainties and the instability um, that young people face in their lives. And they should also take into account the context in which these students or young people um, that are being targeted by these interventions um, live. Equally, the style of facilitation and the ability of educators to listen to and understand their students' perspectives is essential um, in gaining their trust, but also to avoid that students simply shut up, uh, shut up, sorry, um, when confronted with opinions that are different from their own. Um, interventions that are non-prescriptive engaging, relatable, and enjoyable for students generally have a much greater chance of generating um, positive change than those that are not delivered in a way that's um, appropriate for the intended audience. So as general conditions are fulfilled, education initiatives can be effective in countering very specific aspects of extremism. But as I said, there are caveats. Um, now, in the paper, I discussed a number of different intervention types within, within the education system, and I'm just going to highlight a few approaches that we found some promising evidence for. I'm keeping the section short because you know, we'll be hearing directly from practitioners about their experiences with some of those approaches. I think that's, um, that, that's going to be much more interesting than my theoretical perspectives on this. And one of the approaches we found promising evidence for are approaches aimed at promoting historical and civic, um, civic education. Um, evidence suggests that these approaches can promote an appreciation for political, religious, and cultural diversity, and for example, reduce recruit, um, racist sentiments. Um, inclusive curricula um, covering multiple perspectives um, of historical, or religious content um, can promote an understanding of a shared common identity among students. This also includes teaching students about uncomfortable and regrettable parts of history and also of contemporary world events. The example of Germany shows, for example, um, Germany's approach in to dealing with its own um, historical legacy through the education system um, demonstrates that debating the government's role in past human rights abuses and in other injustices um, can play a role in combating far-right extremism, but also other forms of extremism, of course. Um, this is, of course, relevant in um, the current context as many um, countries and are starting to deal with their own racist histories or racist aspects of their, their own histories in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. Um, and of course, this can also be applied in, in many other contexts. But 
um, should just note that there is a risk of um, citizenship education and similar educational approaches being used to mandate how students think um, and act, to, you know, in order not to become terrorists, rather than encouraging um, independent thinking. Likewise, um, educational curricula that focus on national identity, history, and values can be misused to overtly assert the dominance of a specific group over others um, if they exclude, for example, references to um, linguistic and ethnic minorities or if they ban education in minority languages. Um, another one of the more promising approaches we found is improving the ability of students to critically evaluate arguments and perspectives they're confronted with. This can make students better at seeing through the, the simplistic and binary narratives and worldviews of violent extremists. Um, bringing controversial topics up in classroom settings and debating them openly and respectfully um, can also take some of the leverage away from extremist recruiters who are otherwise often able to capitalize on more um, controversial and sensitive discussions. In contrast to civic and historical education, um, which tend to mandate um, what students should think. Um, these approaches um, aimed at encouraging, uh, that are aimed at encouraging um, critical thinking skills, a way that uh, address the way in which young people process and interrogate information they're confronted with. In the current context of the global pandemic, um, this could, for example, um, be relevant in improving um, the ability of students to question um, and discount conspiracy theories they're confronted with, which have, of course, been um, used by extremist groups across the spectrum in recent months. And similarly, improving integrative complexity or the ability of students to acknowledge and understand perspectives of others um, is a very promising approach that we found, and we'll hear much more about this in a minute in one of the upcoming presentations. But yet, I should also note that um, Improving resilience through critical thinking doesn't work in all contexts, um, as extremist narratives in some contexts are far from irrational. For example, um, the grievances voiced by extremists um, on, for example, structural inequality, poverty, injustice, discrimination, etc., are often very real. And it takes more than critical thinking alone to, um, to discount these. Um, these narratives and these, you know, very good reasons to join an, an extremist groups in certain situations. So again, context matters with these interventions. Now in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, the relationship between education and extremism is very context dependent and multifaceted. And the success of PCB interventions is also highly dependent on local factors. Education initiatives can only address a limited range of concerns um, but carefully designed um, ed education interventions can play a role in making young people more resilient to radicalization or recruitment efforts. While perpetuating the image of extremists as uneducated and presenting um, education initiatives as the universal remedy to violent extremism is unhelpful, education can play a limited but very important role um, to counter the threat of um, extremist violence. Now with that, go back to you, Gayatri. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was very fascinating. Um, and I'd now like to turn to uh, Professor Davies and her presentation on connecting. Sorry, we can't hear you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, how do we, how are we going? Okay? Yes, great, thank you. Right, thank you very much, yes. And uh, greetings to everybody. Um, it's very strange having a, a great unknown audience out there, um, but also it means you can all go off and have a cup of tea and I will certainly won't know. Um, I've called this what we think works. Um, increasingly, um, one gets less and less certain about what, what works. Um, so it's, it's a question of, of sharing with you the learning that I and our organization is doing, and hopefully you'll have questions about that. Um, my talk's based on two 
international reviews. One um, was done by for the University of Gothenburg, the Review of Educational Initiatives. And I think Claudia drew on that quite a lot in the, in the study that, that she did. And then a second one um, for EU Round Radicalization Awareness Network, which was the ways that governments support schools. So the first one looked at sort of interventions within the education sector, within schools, say colleges. And the second one looked at um, national policies. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So I've got the research side and then um, practical learning from all our working Connect Futures, um, which I'll share with you. Um, We've reached, well, we think something like 83,000 students and lots and lots of teachers, as well as um, public sector workers. So, but we're still, we're still learning, we're still trying to get feedback, we're still working on, on thinking about what, what's, what's happening in this, in this hugely complex field. First of all, then, a bit of theory, what are the principles, and this came out from the first study of um, 23, 20 countries, 23 different sorts of initiatives. Um, I, don't, I won't read this to you, but you can see some of the um, common things, which I think works in preventing violent extremism. And these aren't rocket science, and, and you would, I don't think there's anything that's particularly controversial here. You've got to embed, if you're going to have a strategy on, on tackling violent extremism in your school, it's got to be embedded in the whole school policy. There's no point in having, just doing it on a Friday afternoon and then being beating the kids violently all the rest of the time. It's got to be part of the whole school ethos of safeguarding. Teachers have got to be well prepared. I'll come back to that. You've got to acknowledge the drivers of extremism as, as multiple work with a whole pile of other actors and recipients. Um, number six, um, and this, this comes back to the critical thinking, um, not just about learning about other faiths, but understanding conflict, understanding extremism, extremism and if necessary understanding the role of religion and faith in conflict. And trying to get some practical work. Uh, I think Claudia mentioned civic engagement. Um, getting kids to do things and not just be the recipient of people telling them what not to do. The national policies are country specific, obviously. The research for this was, was a nightmare, um, trying to establish what a country's national policy is, how far it's for education, how far it's linked into uh, an, an overall country policy on counter-terror, or is it under violent extremism, and how do you find out? And people, you know, is it the Ministry of Education that knows what it is, or is it the Home Office or equivalent of justice? So it was a nightmare, the research, but we managed to get some, some ideas of, of what seems transferable in terms of national policy, what is absolutely crucial if you're going to have a policy on, on violent extremism. Uh, and obvious, again, national action plans, well-financed accountability, lines of communication, people know what's going on lots of partnerships, funding, permanent structures for advice and support for schools so that schools know where to go. If they've got an issue with, with violent extremes and they've got, a, they've got a setup, they know who to contact, they know who to ring locally or nationally. There's websites, there's something there that teachers will be able to draw on. And teacher education is part of that. And I think there are huge gaps in teacher education in terms of uh, preparing teachers for all the things, not just integrative complexity, but, but the whole spectrum of, of terrorism, counter-terror, vulnerability, violence, um, and, and generally teaching controversial issues and a whole school approach. So I would think you'd say probably there's nothing there that's, that's new. But it, it's, it's important to stress that when, when one's thinking about trying to argue for a national policy. And I think it's, this is a key thing. It cannot be left at the local level. OK, here's where I offend all sorts of people. What doesn't work? And I think what doesn't work in terms of trying to prevent violent extremism or recruitment into violent gangs and movements what doesn't work is just telling kids to love each other and, and get on and be nice. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't tell kids to be nice <laughs> or respect each other, but that is not enough in terms of building resilience. What doesn't work is the one-off event with no follow-up. I mean, you can have great stuff with theatre groups and visits to the mosque and all of that. Um, 
And there's a lot of box ticking that goes on with preventing violent extremism. And a school will say, yeah, we've done that. You know, we, last Friday we did this and so we've done that now. Um, the inoculation thing where they're now inoculated, it's got to be sustained. I will offend UNESCO here by saying they global citizenship. Um, there's a lot of, again, it becomes a box ticking exercise to say global citizenship will act as a preventive measure. It depends how it's done, but the problem with global citizenship is that it can be, it, it's, it's diverted into things teachers are comfortable in, uh, environment, dropping litter, again, being nice to each other. Um, so if you're gonna use that, it's got to be very, very hard hitting. I don't need to talk too much about interfaith learning if it, if it leads to stereotypes about others. What doesn't work is saying to kids, don't say that, don't, don't talk about, don't mention the J word, don't mention the you know, extremism word. You've got to allow kids to express this talk, even if it's very uncomfortable. And I think Claudia's already mentioned the whole problem of, of identifying those at risk um, when you are criminalizing young, in, young people in what should be the pre-criminal space. And there's been a lot of mistakes made, but I think you know, we're learning all the time on that. So I think we come back to essentials in, if you're going to update one's anti-extremism work, first of all, we're doing a lot of work around contextual safeguarding, which is making sure that we're, if we're training in schools, we're talking about extremism violence in a local context. I'll come back to that. Teachers have to know what's going on um, in the law around this, what is hate speech, what constitutes hate speech, what doesn't, what's the difference between hate speech and hate crime, and that's all different uh, with different countries. And knowing what the government policy is, and we found that from the national survey, um, different countries insist on the different roles of teachers in identifying those at risk, and some say no it's not your job to do that, other countries will say no that's your responsibility. So it's knowing what that is. What we're working on a lot is the crossovers. It's not just talking about extremism on its own. You've got to be talking about the links between extremism, knife crime, drugs, county lines, grooming, racism. And there's a huge lot of crossovers there and intersectionality between those areas. So that some young person might start off in a violent gang and switch across to, to a, a a religious um, extremism or, far, or more likely far right extremes either way um, but there's a lot of crossovers and toing and froing it's underneath understanding some of those trajectories complexity far right far left as well as islamism but also the diluted forms you know when when does nationalism start to verge into extremism when are these so-called patriotic things uh, messages going to uh, seem benign but in fact are, are underpinning all sorts of highly dubious messages and currently of course how are extremist groups capitalizing on what's going on and they are they're capitalizing on covid they're capitalizing on the black lives matter in terms of all the protests it's understanding how um, current events get get um, what's the word i want sort of diverted into um, support for extremist movements I think this is a word also relatability um, and Claudia's already mentioned this and I won't stress that we've got to listen to what teachers want from training what they want from a national policy and listening to students um, we have to make sure our trainers and any trainers are very up to date in their referencing um, do you do they use the right sort of language do they use the right sort of visual prompts um, I, have, I don't do any of the training personally, I'd have no credibility with young people, but our trainers are, are brilliant folks, a whole range of, of um, youth workers, ex-offenders, ex-extremists, um, cage fighters, people who are working in hospitals with victims of stabbing, you know, you've got to have people who've got a, 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 a huge credibility with young people so they can get this trust. And trainers knowing the vocabulary, I'll come on to that. So we asked teachers when we first start, do you feel confident when we, if we're training with teachers? Do you feel confident talking about hate crime? Do you know what the prescribed groups are in your locality? What's a community? What do you understand of it? Do you understand how county lines work? Um, and so we, we ask them how confident they are. And we move into contextual safeguarding. For example, um, 
these are the different symbols that um, are now very current um, in different parts. We, we try to make it localized again. So this is Birmingham, Aston University campus. Um, one of my colleagues has been going around collecting all the various bits of graffiti and the stickers which are now going up. Um, and he, um, free Tommy Robinson normies, that's um, Peppy the Frog, which you may not recognize, but it's been co-opted by outright groups. Um, so all the symbolic stuff is, is really important to understand what, what those are and what the what fashy means, fascist boys and all sorts of language. And so we use a lot of visuals like this. Um, knowing the names of all of the different knives. Do you know all those names? I didn't know all those names. But again, in a particular locality, it's knowing the sort of weapons that are being used in violence. So you can talk coherently to young people. They know what the words are. Um, sometimes you can do mapping where you're trying to get young people to understand what's safe. Um, and locate, if, you're, if you're feeling unsafe, what is that? Where do you go to feel safe? What are the areas? leaving school where you're more likely to be attacked or more likely to be um, trying to draw into a movement or trying to be drawn into a gang. So that, that's quite an interesting exercise. Um, we show this was a gang fight uh, after we showed this into, into one school and one of the teachers says, I know that guy, I taught him. It was quite interesting. So I think they appreciate if you can go before you actually do any training, make sure you've got the local stuff there. So the key message, I think, is to young people is protect yourself. It's not about, um, although there's some work on that about understanding ideology and the curriculum and all of that, but the key message that we would use always is, is protect yourself. And this has four baselines. And the first one is an obvious one about media literacy, recognizing fake news, filter bubbles, echo chambers understanding how recruitment works, how they get to you, controversial issues, um, and building confidence. And these, I think, are the four baselines which, which together might build some, some resistance, might build some resilience. For example, oh, I've seized up. What's happened? Oh, here we are. Fake news. Here we are. So we, if you're working with young people, you start using slides and getting them to tell about what's real or fake news. Justin Bieber's a pro skateboarder. True or false? I'll leave it with you. Young people argue indefinitely about that. And then you can move on to the more serious, if you like, bits of fake news. The newspapers never lie. How true is that? What's the research based on? Secondly, then recruitment, trying to talk with young people about how they persuade you, the sort of messages you want to change things, um, your identity, you want to oppress, help oppress people. So, you know, join us, trying to make them feel important, um, how they contact you, what's the latest way, is it leaflets, phone, WhatsApp, no longer are they just leaving the leaflets outside the school, there's a lot more sophisticated ways. This goes back to media literacy. Um, a lot of the stuff around redemption, they don't care about their past, it's about the future, it's about what you can do. Um, vengeance and money, there's a whole pile of persuasive means, persuasive uh, messages, and it's, you know, we don't necessarily know what those are going to be, but it's, it's, it's making young people understand the different ways in that groups will try to use, use to get to you. Um, the sort of messages, call of duty, so you appeal to the, the whole notion of duty and the whole gaming field, the wonderful uh, way of putting that together, you only die once. So it's, it's making sure they understand how um, this imagery and symbolism is used. Um, sometimes it's saying, presenting, this is a lovely one, isn't it, ISIS showing, um, we're soft really, we like cats and we, you know, we all eat. Um, crunchy bars and Kit Kats and you know we're all lovely people really come and join us and at the far right so looking at um, how far right message youth needs your support um, 
and this is well, protect the poppies. It's a very cunning one, isn't it? You know, who, poppies, what's not to like? Um, but it's a way of saying you protect the poppy by joining Britain first and the, all of these nationalist movements, some of which prescribed and some not. And again, it's important for teachers to know what's prescribed, what isn't. Um, West, comparing Western society and Islamic society, we don't hide beauty in the West. Some really nasty um, propaganda here. So we talk about the reality. Um, this came from the is We did some research um, on former extremists and the backgrounds and talked to them about why they entered, why they came out. This is just a classic one from one guy. He said, I thought I was going to meet a cast of highly noble individuals. We thought we were going to be unpaid mercenaries and so on. Uh, I had an image of guys with radiant light coming off their faces, but some of these were exploiting women. They were criminals. So sharing with young people and with teachers how people went into movements and, uh, and were misled in terms of what happened. So we, we Sorry, both... Professor Davies, you're like, you have 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Over time. All right. Okay. So can I just, I'll just do the foot last one. So controversy, I think Rafia will talk some more about that. Um, hot topics, moral dilemmas. Um, can, I, can I just, just mention this one's wonderful. Um, we, we've made films of two mothers who lost their sons to extremism. And again, it's introducing shock to young people so that, to understand um, how people respond. And that was a very powerful thing. So these films are on our websites if you want to see them. And the final one is um, trying to work with young people to speak for yourself. If they understand they can speak, if they understand how to argue, how to debate, how to stand up for themselves, they're less likely to be vulnerable. So we've done a lot of work on, on debates um, and getting people who, young people who said they couldn't possibly um, uh, speak and they didn't understand it to actually have a voice. And that's a key thing. Right. So key message, question everything and somebody underneath it and why. I like that. that. That is very interesting. Um, so um, we still have a way to go. We still got to follow up. We're still trying to find more feedback and we need a research base for what we're doing. Sorry to go on so long. No, I think it's very clear there was a lot to say and um, we're sorry to have to cut you off, but uh, we do want to give our third speaker a chance to speak as well as talk about um, quite a different context. So Rafia, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been very interesting listening to uh, the work that Connect Futures has been doing, uh, Professor Lin. And I must say that uh, much of what you've said really resonates with us, but uh, without taking too much time on that, I think I will begin the presentation and maybe I can add in some as we move on to the Q&A section. So I will be talking today about uh, the work that we have been doing, uh, particularly in relation to the educational initiatives that we've taken. And this is again, a practitioner's perspective, uh, focusing only on integrative complexity in our work with the violent extremist populations. Uh, so the work we do, just an overview of it, we work, uh, we've had a DRAD center, which uh, has recently closed down because all the youth has been reintegrated. So we reintegrated uh, 236 boys uh, who were actually involved in violent extremism and there were 45 who had voluntarily enrolled into the program as well under PBE. We have a monitoring center which continues to support the CVE boys who have graduated. Uh, we so far in the last 10 years have just one case uh, who has gone back to militancy and he in fact uh, was killed in uh, an encounter with the police. Uh, we've also done a bit of capacity building. I'm not going to go into that. We have some preventive work going on with some boys schools in the Savat region where a uh, majority of the recruitment of these boys was from. Uh, but mainly we are going to be talking, uh, focusing on integrative complexity, which uh, I believe uh, Claudia has also touched on briefly. So I'll just be going into a bit more detail of that. Um, so this study was actually done in uh, August 2018, and the data from that and the results is what I will be discussing. Just a brief overview, uh, the population that I'm talking about is actually the violent extremist uh, youth that was inducted at Sabaun, and in the process over there is very individualized, it's very comprehensive, and it's run by psychologists, uh, myself included. 
along with a great team, including Dr. Faria Paracha, Asma Ayub, and uh, a few others as well. Then we have the monitoring center, which consists of psychologists and social workers. They conduct mainly uh, field visits to interact with the youth and to make sure that the youth is goal directed. And that we feel is one thing that really does prevent them from going back into militancy. So just coming to the paper itself, um, it's an intervention of integrative complexity in thinking and uh, specifically with the violent extremist youth of Sabaun. So we have three categories of it, the inducted, the enrolled, which would be the PVE population and the reintegrated, which is the Sabaun graduates. So what is IC just briefly? Uh, it is basically how information is processed. So it can either be really simple, which would be black or white, completely polarized or binary. Then this complex, which means that you have different perspectives that are legitimate and can help form conceptual links to integrate these perspectives. It deals with the structure of thinking rather than the content of thinking, which I believe that Claudia has also touched upon. Uh, where the IC thinking intervention is concerned, this is a specific method that has been developed by the IC thinking Cambridge. Uh, it's an organization based at Cambridge University and it promotes the development of the structure of thinking or the scaffolding. And that's mainly related to critical thinking. It enables participants to use the metacognition or to be able to think about their own thinking and to move out of the binary or polarized thinking into grace. So it does deal with empathy and with social intelligence. Uh, it's basically a four stage pattern. Uh, there's firstly a playful exploration where you use parallels to hot topics and social dynamics very indirectly. So you're not specifically talking about issues such as violent extremism. You're talking more about like, uh, I think uh, Professor Lin ended on question uh, things. So it's mainly about encouraging them to question things. So stage B then is to uh, create the binary for them. So you create two uh, sides to it, a polarization in the room and then allowing for the metacognition to occur. Stage three is uh, where differentiation occurs and there's a value range or a spectrum of it that uh, is highlighted underpinning the conflicts which are relevant to extremism. And stage D would be integration where these perspectives are brought together. So the empirical basis, if you look at that, it's uh, basically a non fakeable and predictive measure and it's used to validate interventions in the field. It's 80 group interventions have been done so far over a decade, and it's across a range of extremisms and cultural contexts using pre and post tests. And all the courses so far uh, have shown significant gains in IC, which reflect inappropriate changes to manage conflict. So the IC course has been run in different schools across nine countries and in different communities as well. These findings have reinforced the parameters of the current study with the Sabaun population. So the Sabaun course specifically has been designed and developed by IC Thinking and Sabat for Pakistan. This consists of eight sessions with each session for two hours or 16 contact hours. And the themes have been contextualized specifically for the region itself with the target population in question. So the pre-test and post-test is basically a paragraph completion test or a PCT. In-group and out-group uh, is what is asked in there. So basically we ask uh, which group that they identify with the most and which group they identify with the least. The course itself has been conducted with uh, the Sabaun population, which would be the CVE, a vulnerable population, which is enrolled at Sabaun under uh, the PVE and the graduate of Sabah own and the reintegrated. That is again in three different categories, which I will discuss as we move forward. So just to give you an overview, I will not repeat this just to save time. Uh, the findings itself is very important from a perspective of research in the field of DRAD, uh, especially at Sabah and from a practitioner's perspective. The youth of Sabat were easily beguiled, and this is why this is so important. And they uh, were able to just uh, uh, believe anything that they were told. So those who had ap were apprehended had joined militancy thinking that they were fighting a foreign force in Pakistan and that it was so decreed by the Quran without really questioning uh, anything about it. So the credibility was not there. 
but it was very persuasive. So this course we feel is something that can encourage people to at least question as uh, Professor Lin was also talking about. So overall, we see that uh, across all these groups, uh, there has been a substantial gain in IC. The pretest or the IC scores, which were low across, uh, does reflect thinking that was uh, structured simply categorically and in black and white terms. And you can see from the graph here that the higher IC gain, gains regarding the out group are pretty uh, significant here. And it is predictive of a decrease in intergroup conflict and polarization as the out group is no longer completely derogated or dehumanized. And uh, therefore the causes of grievances are not simply blamed on one cause or the group itself. And where the outgroups are concerned, there are differing viewpoints which are afforded some validity. We're not saying they completely accept it, but they are given some credit at least. And some common values are also found. Uh, this represents that there is a lessening of the adherence to extremist or polarized uh, positions marked by black or white thinking. So the effect size uh, of this outgroup is large. And here we're talking about an effect size related to uh, the change in the IC and not with the sample size itself. So uh, just trying to clarify that as we move forward. Where the PVE group is concerned, you can see uh, very clearly that the outgroup changes are very significant compared to the in-group ones. This does uh, represent a protective lessening of the attractiveness of black and white extremist discourse. And you can see previously it was uh, pretty much in black and white, which is the score of one. Uh, or anything less than two really. And the effect size here is uh, very large as you can see for the out group. So the CVE group, if you look at that, uh, IC scores are very low in the pretest and the IC gains are somewhat higher regarding the out group in the post test. Again, this is predictive of a decrease in the intergroup conflict and polarization. Effect size is moderate to moderately strong for the out group, but trivial for the in group uh, and in one case even negative. So the overall results are slightly stronger for the PVE than the CVE. It's important for me to highlight here that the CVE group was still undergoing uh, de-radicalization and rehabilitation at this point. So the changes we can understand why they are not as significant as the PVE or as we'll see later in the reintegrated groups. So where we have the reintegrated group, uh, overall you can see that the IC gains for the out group and the in group are significant here. Uh, more so for the outgroup than the in-group. Uh, the effect size of is large for the outgroup and moderate for the in-group. And if you again compare it with the CVE, their increases for uh, of IC for the outgroup are highly important. Uh, but it's very, very beneficial that the RI group were also able to perceive that the in-group uh, has a balance of positive and negatives and were able to perceive them in a multi-dimensional way. Uh, regarding the outgroup, they are able to balance that uh, much more substantially uh, than they were previously. And that basically reflects that they are able to integrate their view as well as the views of others. So if we look at uh, PVE, CVE and RI uh, or reintegrated, this is uh, the pre and post graph for that. Again, you can see very clearly that the PVE has the most significant gains uh, where the outgroup future is concerned. Um, again, there are definitely changes, uh, positive changes for the CVE and RI populations as well. Now highlights from the reintegrated group. Uh, now that again, as I had uh, specified earlier, is three groups again broken down within the reintegrated, which would be the MC residents. These are youth that are residing at the monitoring center, which also serves as a halfway house. Uh, they're about, they're, I believe at that point, there are about 13 youths residing there. Then there's a VTC group, uh, which is the vocational training. Again, these are not very academically oriented, have very basic education, maybe about sixth or eighth grade. And then the educational group, which goes up to uh, completion of bachelor's or graduates. What does this mean for the RI group? It basically means that the ones who had the education were able to perceive the in-group with a balance of positive and negatives in a multi-dimensional way, indicating that the IC course had a very broad impact on them. It enabled them to balance higher IC regarding their own views as well as the views of others. Uh, these and the other results 
show that the more academically inclined or experienced youth is, that they are able to achieve slightly better results than those who are not. Uh, so in conclusion, the purpose is to uh, enable the vulnerable youth to be able to think critically with social intelligence and with empathy. The IC method promotes more complex and integrated thinking, which builds resilience to overly simplified binary narratives that falsely promise quick solutions to complex problems. I'd just like to add here that Professor Lin was talking about uh, discussing very basic things uh, or showing them different sides of it and questioning whether Justin Bieber, for example, is a skateboarder or not just because he's holding a skateboard. So there is one entire session that is framed around that and it's called Tricks with Words, which helps uh, youth or any participants really to be able to see uh, what persuasion is and how they sometimes do get persuaded and how to be able to see through these tricks of manipulation. So it's enabling them to be able to question that. Moving on, uh, the results from the current research are very promising uh, as all the subbound groups exhibited a very positive change in their ability to take the different perspectives, apply contextual reasoning, reasoning and weigh up arguments in a very balanced way, which are all features of IC. Again, very significant that all the pretests did reflect low IC thinking abilities. And also very significant is that the in a scaffolding has been encouraged uh, which enables them to think critically with empathy and social intelligence. In particular, their perceptions about the outgroup change significantly uh, across all the subbound groups. And this finding is predictive of reduction in violence and conflict. Uh, whether that is actually the case, I suppose we can't really say uh, for maybe a few years, but we are working on doing a follow-up after two years, which will be sometime this year to be able to see whether the IC is still at the same level, higher or lower, and try to uh, assess that further. This was perhaps the first research of an empirically based intervention with such a large cohort of boys who had been radicalized and were involved at different levels of militancy. The difference between the academic and the vocational cohort was particularly revealing because it showed that the, uh, it's immensely important that education and learning can enhance and reinforce IC changes. Uh, it's indicated of decreasing intergroup stereotypes, prejudices, discrimination, et cetera. How does IC work? Mainly uh, it's the social nature of thinking, which is made conscious by eliciting metacognition in a context of a group intervention, which exists uh, of their own peers. So individuals' commitment to their new cognitive change is strengthened as the IC course peer groups provide a social experience of a more nuanced thinking. All this adds up to young people being able to see through extremist discourse and perceive more constructive pathways to be able to bring about that gradual change. This is underpinned by new skills for managing personal conflict and emotions in a more constructive way. In the way forward and how we are taking this forward is that there is a need uh, which was highlighted from this research uh, for a slower stepwise IC scaffolding, uh, especially in the context of Pakistan, at least. I don't know how well this would apply for uh, other regions, but it's important to work at a more concrete level of thinking to avoid the abstract categories and to lessen the tendency to give the facilitator the right answer by focusing more on the peer-to-peer -peer feedback instead. Why? Uh, mainly in order to help the less academically inclined gain as much as possible from the IC course training. And this would be especially true uh, for a lot of youth who do get involved in uh, militancy or extremism in many ways in other countries, not particularly in Europe or in Pakistan. So the changes already have been accommodated into the design for the Pakistan IC schools course, uh, which is to be delivered. Well, it was supposed to be delivered a few months ago. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it has been delayed till the schools reopen. Uh, what are our next steps? We are considering also adapting this uh, with the school curriculum, using some of the literature from it and shaping the sessions around that. Uh, and trying to see how we can uh, maybe also work on developing some online sessions and uh, have more access to others. Uh, so I will end it here. Happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you. Thank you to all panelists. This has really been a very exciting session. Um, we do have a couple of questions which I would like to pose to you. Um,
the first question that we have, I think, uh, if Claudia, you can take this question, and it came out as sort of a comment, but I think it's also helpful to ask. Um, so we don't really see too much of a statistically significant relationship between education and the proclivity for extremism. Um, and perhaps you can stress on, you can uh, maybe uh, find some aspects of this. Did you find any aspects of this in your research? Because there's been a lot of research which has proved you know, that in fact, more educated uh, individuals who are actually linked to uh, violent extremism versus less educated. So there is a lot of variability. And maybe you can comment on anything that you found, which was about the level of education specifically and um, links with violent extremism. So perhaps you can comment on this and then- you can Sure, um, given that we only have a few minutes left, I'm gonna keep this short. Um, this is a very rich body of, um, of literature um, that you know that's out there on uh, on these links. Um, one of the things that we found, for example, is that um, in some countries, um, if people attain higher levels of education, but they but then they're not able to follow up this you know higher level of education with um, matching employment opportunities, that may actually serve as a grievance that can um, drive individuals into violent extremism. Mm -hmm. Another thing um, that we found is that. Um, better educated um, people actually make for more effective extre more effective terrorists. So terrorist attacks that are perpetrated by more educated terrorists tend to be more effective in killing more people. Um, but there there have been a couple of studies out there on um, kind of the, the context, the broader context of the country um, and um, political, economic um, and social conditions really framing how that relationship between extremism and edu education plays out. So I think there's not one straightforward link or one answer to how education links with um, with higher or lower levels of, of violent extremism in a country. Yes, sure. Um, and so maybe some to um, Professor Davies, if you could perhaps talk a little bit more about, um, you know, there are a lot of different types and this comes, uh, this question is from Mike. Um, there are a lot of different types of schools and some schools are just located in colonies and in areas where there is a lot of um, violence in general. So what can we learn from the experiences of schools which are specifically in areas where violence is just more prevalent and it might not be violent extremism? And are there any lessons that we can draw from, from their experience? Um, you're muted. Okay, I think I think this re this refers a lot to what I was talking about in, in terms of the crossovers of violence. If if we're doing work in in areas where there is known massive gang violence, uh, where kids do not feel safe at any stage of the day, um, then one one gears a lot of work into just just self protection and understanding. Um, how you can avoid um, being drawn into a gang, how you can how you can live and have a status and have an identity without being a member of a, a movement that, that a so-called protects you. So I think you have to you have to change the training a lot. I mean, there are the basic things that I was talking about, you know, media literacy and and uh, and so on that that every everybody does. But I think I, the, if you're going to be talking about areas with with high levels of violence, whether it's in as, I said gang violence or abuse or grooming gangs or whatever um, you've got to gear the training into knowledge of how that's working and how that um, how those gangs are operating what their names are you know this is my point about the contextual feel to to that so that it's it makes makes the training much more specific and, and young people will understand that you're not just coming in saying don't don't carry a don't carry a gun don't carry a knife it's got to be more than don't carry a knife don't carry a gun, don't get drawn in. It's got to be saying, what can you do physically to be, a, you know, to protect yourself and others and your peers? That makes sense. Okay. Yes, yes, that does make a lot of sense. Um, and I think uh, there's a couple of questions for Rafia for you as well. Um, and one of the questions was on, you know, what ages are represented in the Sabaung groups? Um, and also, if you could just comment about how soon uh, was the intervention, um, how soon after the intervention was the measurement done? And perhaps just a question for me, uh, which is, um, you know, was there any control group or did you treat the other cohorts as control groups in your design? Uh, I'd, uh, sorry, I'd request you to repeat the first question again. Uh, then uh, so the first question was uh, about the age group. 
um, what are the ages? And then the question about um, how soon was the intervention, how soon after the intervention was the measurement done? Uh, so first of all, the age range uh, varied greatly. It was the youngest were 14 and the eldest were around 24. The reintegrated groups were naturally a, a higher age than those who were inducted. So that is actually a very good question to ask. Uh, the mean age, I think I did mention was about 19 or so. Uh, again, that is very different from the youngest to the oldest, if you can uh, see that. Secondly, uh, the post test was done at the time the intervention was completed. So uh, it was done at the end of the workshop. Again, two years on, we are planning to uh, redo the, inter not the intervention, just the post test to see what kind of changes uh, we'll be able to find now. Uh, regarding your third question, uh, which was, I'm sorry, I'll have to ask you to repeat that as well. No worries, it was on the control design. Um, and if you treat the cohorts as control groups. So there hasn't been any control group. Uh, we are planning on taking a sample from a control group for the uh, PCTs again uh, with this reintegrated population specifically. So we're going to see from the reintegrated youth, uh, those who have undergone the intervention and those who haven't to see if there are any changes in the overall IC. Uh, which we do think will give us some idea at least. So uh, they, we are doing that. Uh, regarding the current program that we are uh, trying to get underway, depending on when this pandemic allows us to, we are planning on taking uh, control groups from different schools as well. Uh, not the same school because it does have a snowball effect. So we'll have to be very careful about uh, seeing which schools we can choose so we don't have any confounding variables. So we're looking into that. That is uh, great. And um, I think those are the main questions that we had. So I would really like to thank all the panelists um, for your extremely exciting presentation. And normally I think we end up just doing, you know, in CVE, we end up just talking about the same things. And I think this is like pushing us to think more. It's, it's asking us to be more contingent and it's asking us to really be evidence-based as in what the prevention project is all about. So thank you very much. And again, um, to the participants, if you would like to join us, uh, please do join us again uh, next week for uh, the second Lucy seminar, and this is on preventive communication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. I'm the only one left. <laughs> How do I get out? <laughs>